Good morning, everyone, and welcome to my lab. Today, I'm going to be doing a bit of a different video from my usual pure electronics content. Uh, uh, I've got a collection of samples that I'm going to be sending off to Breaking Taps to go image on his new microscopy channel. So if you're not already subscribed to Micrographia, you might want to head over there and check them out. And so I thought I would do a little video on how some of these samples were prepared and a bit more on microscopy sample preparation for specifically electronics materials type samples. And so what I've got for you today is uh, a BGA, I don't know if the camera will focus, I'll get a close up later. I've got a cross section of a BGA, I've already partially cut it on a diamond uh, table saw. And so we've just got one half of it. Uh, I'm actually sending the other sample, the other half of the sample off to Breaking Taps, and this is the second half that I'm going to be preparing for my own lab. And the second sample we've got is a TQFP microcontroller. You can see I've already put it in a little plastic uh, spring to hold it upright on edge, and I've cut off the pins so it fits in the mold. And we are going to be casting both of these into a transparent epoxy. Uh, in this case, we're going to be using a bond F113 from Adam Adhesives. It's a very low viscosity epoxy. You can see how runny the resin is. It's, uh, I believe, the mixed viscosity is somewhere around uh, three or 400 centipedes. So it's uh, a lot thinner than the usual epoxy if you're more familiar with like some of the West systems and stuff like that. This is nothing like that. Um, this actually is my first time using F113. I usually use F110, which has a shorter shelf life, and so this test is actually kind of an experiment on my end to qualify F113 for these purposes as well and see how it works. And uh, speaking of epoxy, it's definitely not good to be breathing it. There's all sorts of uh, nasties in both the resins and the hardeners that you really don't want to be inhaling or getting on your skin. So definitely safety first, proper PPE, eye protection, gloves, and work in a limited area, or ideally a fume hut. So now I am going to begin preparing the molds. Uh, we've got two different molds here for the different samples. So the TQFP is just going to go in this little micro centrifuge tube because it's small, and the BGA is a little bit larger. So for that, we're actually going to be using one of these molds. These are actually pretty clever. They only came out a few years ago. Uh, the idea is if you're doing a cross-section of a long, skinny object, you don't necessarily want to waste a whole bunch of epoxy making a giant round puck. And so this is on unless you put your sample right in the middle and you've still got this big ring of resin around it just to provide mechanical support and lets you keep it a lot more square so you don't have to worry about it tilting as you're polishing and you get a nice straight end on polish. And so that's really nice for larger samples. Uh, you can pick these up from a lot of microscopy suppliers. I got this one from Ted Pella, but I'm sure they sell them elsewhere too. Uh, the micro centrifuge tubes do work well as molds. They're a lot smaller. They are a little bit trickier to get a really square polish. So you'll probably see as we start polishing this one, this is probably going to end up being a slightly beveled finish instead of quite square. And so if I really care about getting a super perfect polish, then I would probably pick up a second one of these molds. But honestly, I'm kind of doing the second shift. It's a freebie because I've got extra epoxy and I might as well use it. So the first step is to prepare the mold so that the samples don't stick to them when we're moving them. Uh, in this case, I'm just going to be spraying them down with some epoxy mold release. Now that I've got mold release all these gloves, I'm going to go take them off and get a new pair that isn't all nasty. And I'll leave the old gloves in the hood because the mold release has some uh, volatile solvents in it. So I'm just going to let that evaporate before I put them in the trash. And now let me just move the camera so that you can see a little bit better. Hopefully there's not too much background noise from the fume hood. Uh, we'll see. This is my first time using this camera for this purpose. Okay, so we've got... The two molds are prepared. I'm just going to wipe a little bit of the extra mold release off the exterior so they're easier to handle without slipping out of my hands. And now the next step is going to be to put the samples in them. So this is our TQFP sample. I'm just going to go kind of shove it in there. And let's see, these, these springs are meant for a larger sample. Hold oh, this is something that's a little tricky to get in there. All right, yeah, so we can close the lid and we're good. 
And then the TQFP, I'm just going to drop down in there and use this little toothpick to jam it in place. All right, yeah, that should work nicely. Again, these, these clips are unfortunately a little bit tight for this sample hogger, but they should work, no problem. So the next step is to mix up the epoxy. So these come in nice little pre-measured packets, no measuring required. They do cost a little bit more, but if you're doing a lot of small scale samples, it's absolutely worth it. And honestly, it's a little more plastic here you're wasting, but compared to having a bunch of disposable mixing cups, it doesn't really end up being more waste. So we've got uh, one of these is the resin, and one of these is the resin, and one is the hardener. And uh, I'm not actually sure which is which, but it doesn't matter because all we got to do is squeeze this to mix them, and then just kind of run them back and forth a bunch of times. Uh, what I like to do actually is just run them over either the uh, let zoom out a little more so you can see that. I usually just run it over the edge of the table to mix it. And uh, as you can tell by the sound, this does entrain a lot of air in the mixture. So the next step is going to be a vacuum degassing step to get as much of that air out as possible. And again, you can see just how low the viscosity of this epoxy is, which makes it super easy to degas. So to do that, we are going to cut a corner off of here and pour our mixed epoxy out into this little plastic ketchup cup. They're a lot cheaper than official labeled beakers and they do the job just fine. It's not like we need graduations or anything for this. It's all pre-mixed anyway. I'm just gonna stick that on my old gloves so it doesn't uh, stick to my hood. And then we just need to go clean off any epoxy that's stuck to the scissors so we don't get them stuck shut for all eternity. And then our next step is to actually do the degassing operation. So, let's just make sure we can see. I'm just gonna move the camera hat. I don't think the camera is going to be able to see in the uh, vacuum chamber, unfortunately. I will try and see if I can get a good angle for that, but we'll see. So I put the epoxy in the vacuum chamber and stick it in there. And I'm just going to adjust the valves so we can get... Actually, I'll leave that closed until we get the pump running. So I turn on the pump and open the valve. So we can see we got some nice, nice frothing going on in the epoxy. Uh, we'll give it another, maybe one or two more cycles to make sure we get all the air bubbles out of it. So I'm just venting it and pulling vacuum again. Sometimes doing a couple of cycles helps. Okay, so our vacuum chamber is now at atmosphere. We've got our super nice, watery, clear, pretty much fully degassed epoxy. You can see a few tiny microscopic bubbles on the surface. That's not gonna be enough to present a problem to us. And now the only thing left to do is fill up our molds. So I'm gonna start by putting some in the small mold and then we'll just put whatever we have left over in the big one. Okay, so what I like to do with these little uh, microcentrifuge tubes that I use as molds, 
is I put the sample on the top, I close the lid, I flip it over, and then I leave the sample in the bottom portion. And the lids are pretty much watertight, so we don't have to worry about the epoxy leaking out on the uh, bench. And any bubbles in there will just float to the top, and then when we start cutting and polishing the sample, they'll be completely out of the area we care about. And so now I'm just going to pour all of the remaining epoxy into this mold. And it looks like we have just about enough to cover the sample. So that's it for the moment. We now just have to wait 24 hours for the epoxy to cure. You can speed it up by heating it, but that tends to be a little tricky to do without uh, going into thermal runaway. So it's safer if you can afford to wait to wait. And so luckily uh, you guys don't have to wait, but I will be back with you in a day. Okay, so it's the next day and it's time to go take a look at how our samples turned out. So for this one, we just kind of push a little bit and it usually takes a little jiggling and pulling to get it to come loose. It's moving. There we go. So there's our first sample. And it looks like, yep. Got a little bit of, you can see uh, there's some capillary action going on and it wicked up on the sides, so we'll sand that off when we're done. And then here is the other sample. And for this, what I usually do is I just cut the end of the tube and push it out. I'm just gonna grab a screwdriver and push that out and it should just pop out, perfect. So now here is our second sample, and we can see we got a nice void-free transparent casting, so looks just about close. We got one tiny air bubble floating over there. Uh, I am really liking this epoxy. Um, the F113 actually looks like it gives more transparent embeds than the F110, so this, this stuff is definitely a winner. All right, so the next step is going to be for this sample, it's ready to go start polishing and sanding as is. Um, this one is a little bit of an awkward shape because of how long and skinny it is, so I'm gonna go put it on the table saw and we're going to cut it down just a little bit. So now we've cut our small sample down to a reasonable length, and our big sample is still untouched. The first step is going to be to sand both of them down uh, with, in this case, 220 grit wet sandpaper, just to get roughly near our plane of interest and take off all of the artifacts like the uh, flat, the, the not flat spots up here. Okay, so looking at our larger sample, it seems we've got some separation of the epoxy around the mounting clip. I don't think this is going to be a huge deal, but it is a good thing to pay attention to. Uh, it looks like these sample clips are just a little bit too big for the uh, mold I was using. They, we can see right over here, uh, the uh, there is no epoxy around the sides of the clip. The epoxy just ends. So I will need to use a smaller clip with this mold in the future. But if we take a look from a bit of an angle, we can see the surface is still fairly matte. Obviously, we're using the coarse sandpaper. And more importantly, we have not reached the sample yet. We've probably still got another 1,500 microns to take off. Uh, looking at the second sample, we've got a more interesting result. So we have uh, the 
lead frame clearly visible and a nice line of bond wire. So we are actually getting fairly close to the die here, I think. Um, I may actually call this good for the 220 grit sandpaper and switch to the finer grit. Uh, the reason being that if we use too coarse a grit when we start hitting the silicon, we will crack the die and it'll be a problem to deal with later. So this may actually be good to stop with the 220 on this sample and then just continue on the other one. And now here we are after another 10 minutes of polishing and we can see that the edge of the sample is beginning to come into view. We haven't quite fully exposed it, so it looks like the sample is actually embedded at a slight angle or the polishing is not quite flat. Uh, either way, for our purposes, it doesn't matter. We don't need an exactly perpendicular section. And this is actually probably a good point to stop with the 250 grit sandpaper because we actually want to be using finer abrasives when we start hitting the actual specimen, in particular because silicon is so brittle. If we use too aggressive abrasives early on, we'll end up cracking it. And there's, there's, I mean, there's probably some damage originally from when it was sawn, but we don't want to make that worse. And so I'm going to switch to probably uh, 500 grit for the next step of polishing. And we can use uh, that to expose the rest of the dye and then switch to finer grits from there on out. So now that we've done the rough grinding with the 220 grit, now we're going to move on to 500 grit silicon carbide. And the goal here is still bulk material removal. We want to get pretty much right up to the edge of the die in both samples, but not into it because the 500 is probably still going to start causing big cracks. So we're going to want to move to say 1200 for that. Since we are still in the bulk material removal phase, the exact polishing motion doesn't really matter. I'm just doing circular because it's easy. When we get on to later steps, it will be important exactly which direction you're rubbing it, and uh, I will get to that. Okay, we are just starting to hit the die, so I'm going to call it good for this polishing pass. So on the BGA cross section, we are just starting to hit the die. Just got one corner of it starting to be exposed, and this was with the 500 grit silicon carbide. Just starting to hit the die. And then if we look at our TQFP cross section, we can see the same thing. We are just barely scraping up against the edge of the die. And so this is the perfect stopping point for the 500 grit. And then we're going to start moving to something a little bit finer. All right, so now we're up to the 1200 grit silicon carbide sandpaper. And our goal now is to fully expose the dye in each sample and get at least somewhat close to the region of interest. Uh, this is still kind of the bulk material phase. We're primarily trying to move our view plane into the sample more so than improving the surface finish. We're just using finer abrasive to get more control over the uh, result and also to avoid cracking the silicon. And again, we're still at the phase where the exact uh, motion of the sanding doesn't particularly matter. As we get to the finer polishing stages where we're actually focusing on surface finish, we're going to want to switch to an alternating horizontal vertical motion. Okay, so I spent another 5-10 minutes polishing and we can see we now have complete separation of the epoxy on this side from the little blue clip which is annoying. It shouldn't greatly impact the results, but uh, definitely this is something to avoid for the future. So uh, next time I'm doing one of these embeds, I'm gonna wanna either use a different kind of sample holder or uh, use smaller clips. So these clips are not a good choice for this holder. And if we zoom in a bit more, we can see that now we've still got one small crack in the die, but it's a lot less bad than it was before. So this should be good if we start doing some uh, finer polishing, and uh, we've got a bond wire and cross section right there, that's cool, we've got one, two, three or four small uh, air bubble voids in the epoxy, but overall the finish is pretty solid, and we've got another bond wire and cross section over there, so yeah, this sample is looking pretty good, and then 
the QFP, we can see we're now all the way through the die and we've got a bond wire in cross section as well. And I think this is probably going to be good to go for a finer polish as well. Uh, the only other thing I will want to do is uh, the thickness of the sample is actually a little bit uh, much. I tried putting this under the metallurgical microscope a minute ago and I couldn't actually see the surface because I couldn't lower the stage enough to focus. So we just have to go take maybe, I don't know, 100 microns off the back. It looks like we're a little bit off square anyway. It's not quite a proper... So yeah, the, the surface we're polishing looks pretty square, but the back surface looks a little bit angled. So we're going to want to polish that up a bit. Okay, so I did a bit more backside sanding on the TQFP sample, and as you can see, we're now able to get the sample in focus. So if we just take a quick look around, we can see we've got a bond wire on the right that's not quite hitting the die yet. We've got a bond wire on the left that is actually hitting the die perfectly. We've got a good view of the die path epoxy for a little bit more. So you've got the die attach epoxy, the copper paddle, and the die itself. Uh, we're not able to see much in the way of detail on the top of the die where the actual logic is, mainly due to the polish not being nearly as good as it needs to be yet. You can see there's still lots of big gouges and scratches in the surface of the sample because we're only at 1200 grit. And now we're going to take a look at the other sample, the BGA. And we can see, again, there's one small crack off on the side here that is uh, probably not going to be too big a deal. And then if we flip back over to the other side, we can see again, we've got a good view of the surface of the die, we've got a good view of some of the VGA balls, and still big scratches everywhere. So the next step is going to be working on surface finish, trying to get this surface from being super scratchy up to something that's actually smooth enough that we can work with it. And for that, we're going to start with 2,000 grit. So now it's time for the second stage of polishing, which is working on surface finish. And so instead of sanding in circles or random motions, now we want to pick a specific direction. It doesn't matter what that direction is, but we want to do each pass in one direction. And uh, the reason for this is that it allows us to determine when we polish enough. And when you see all of these scratches in the sample are oriented in that one direction, there's none going in a different direction, then you know, you've removed all of the deeper scratches from the previous pass and you're done with this pass. And then the next pass you do in a different direction. So in this case, I'm arbitrarily gonna be going up and down on these samples. Uh, in this case, this is 2000 grit silicon carbide. And now that we're not trying to remove a lot of material, it shouldn't take too much time. This is probably already enough, actually. And now let's do the other one. And again, just for consistency's sake, we're going to be going vertically. So here we are on the BGA sample. And if we angle it, it's a little bit easier to tell that pretty much all of these scratches in the sample are going in one direction. And that's good. That means that we've sanded long enough in the vertical direction. So now our next pass is going to be with the 3000 grit silicon carbide in the horizontal axis. And when all these vertical scratches are done, we know that we're finished. And the same thing applies to the TTFP. Again, all of our scratches are vertical. That's good. That means we've gone far enough on this pass. Thousand grit horizontal. And for these finer passes, you really don't need a lot of time. Again, the earlier ones, there was a lot of editing. Each pass took probably 10 minutes of sanding at each grit for the 500 and 1200, maybe even more than that. But now that we're doing uh, just surface finishing, the amount of material we're taking off is so small, it just takes a few seconds.
So I'm just going to show the hull polishing in real time. So I spent actually close to a minute additionally polishing the BGA sample and we can see it looks a lot nicer. Now all of our scratches are horizontal, there's nothing really vertical left. We've got a much nicer texture on the solder balls. And this is probably about as far as we can go on the stereo microscope. We're going to switch to the metallurgical for inspection from here on out just because we can't really see the scratches anymore at 45x magnification. Now we're up to the 4000 grit and we're going to be going vertically. Um, I'm going to show the QFP sample in real time and probably cut the BGA just because it's probably going to take another minute. Alright, so now we just finished the 4000 grit pass and we're looking at the BGA. And we can see pretty much all of our scratches are vertical, which is exactly what we wanted. We got the one big crack there that we're just going to ignore. And looking pretty good over here and off on the right. Closer look. See both layers of the, the copper on the substrate, the dye patch epoxy. You can see the glass fiber in the substrate. And then if we zoom in a little more, we might be able to start seeing some detail on the top of the ship actually at this point. far as this microscope goes, but we can definitely start seeing some detail on the upper metal layers already. This will certainly look better when we get a nicer polish. And then going back to the uh, QFP sample. We can see same situation. Our scratches are pretty much all in one direction, which is exactly what we want. More. There's definitely still some additional polishing left to do, but we're starting to get some nice looking surface quality. And yeah, we can start to make out a bond wire and some of the metal stack here as well. This is a 180 nanometer device, the Aqua is a 130, um, and the BGA is a 65, so we've got a lot more thickness work with here. And unfortunately the, the uh, surface is not quite parallel to our plane. No matter how much I try, I find it's difficult to do that. I need to get a tilt stage of this microscope. Alright, off to 5,000 and up. So here we are another couple minutes later and uh, I didn't bother filming the next two polishing passes which were 5,000 and 8,000 grit. But we can see the surface is now a lot smoother than it was. More at the other side of the BGA. There's still a few scratches, but they're getting a lot smaller. And as we zoom in more, we can see there's a little more detail visible in the diatach epoxy now. Start to see the individual silver grains inside the resin, and there's a lot more detail visible in the upper metal layers of the dye as well. So we can definitely start seeing some more detail in these upper metal layers. Uh, again, the sample is a little bit tilted, we'll worry about that later but it's looking pretty good. We're almost ready for the last two polishing steps. And then on to the QFP.
again, we've got some very fine scratches all running in one direction on the surface of the sample. And uh, all of the bigger scratches are gone. But again, a nice view of the dye attached epoxy. Just like a void in the epoxy on the right. sanding step at 10,000 grit and we can get on to the final polish. So this is our last sanding step using regular sandpaper. We're going to be doing vertical at 10,000 grit. This is our last chance to remove any major surface defects before we go to the final submicron diamond polish. All right, so the 10,000 grit polishing step is done, and before we move on to the final diamond paste, I'm just gonna go give the sample a bit of a more thorough clean to make really sure that there's no large debris on it that's going to contaminate my polishing pads. So I'm just using some distilled water and a syringe to kind of pressure wash the surfaces of the samples and make sure I also get the sides more times. Depending on how fragile your sample is, ultrasonic cleaning may be okay. Uh, given that at least the BGA sample already has some cracks in the silicon, I don't want to risk agitating it more than needs to, so I'm using a, a little bit of a more gentle method here. So now it's time for the final polish and for that we're going to be using 250 nanometer diamond abrasive in the form of this polishing compound. We're just going to put a little dab on the surface of the sample. It'll spread out. And there's already some on this polishing pad, so we're just gonna kind of smear that around a little bit. And now we can use a figure eight pattern. The reason for this is in the earlier polishing steps, we wanted to use uh, one-way patterns in order to determine when we were done with the step. We wanted to know that we had removed all the uh, scratches from the previous pass. In this case, we wanna have a smooth featureless surface when we're done. We don't wanna have any scratches biased in a certain direction. So it's better if we use more of a random pattern and the figure eight does a good job of distributing any remaining scratches in all directions. And next, we're gonna do the same thing on the other sample. Get a little more paste on there. All right, so here we are after the last polish. Uh, it looks like we probably could have gone just a little bit longer. There's a few very slight scratches, but for demonstration purposes, I think this is good enough. See, there's still, yeah, there's a few slight vertical lines that, that didn't quite go away. Uh, I actually stuck a few sheets of paper under the left side of the sample in order to make up for the planarity error. Again, it's, it's never going to be quite perfectly flat, and unfortunately I don't have any tilt stakes in this microscope, but uh, this seems to be doing well enough for the moment. So here we are looking at, we've got the Got one of the uh, BGA balls and the junction where it connects to the pad. Interesting. It looks like there might be some that uh, solder mask to find the pad, maybe. 
light with the uh, brightness there. So in dark field mode, we can see the solder mask on the sides that didn't show up in bright field. And let's go back to bright field again and adjust our exposure again. So yeah, that's our solder mask. And then if we go up a little bit, we can see the two metal layers in the substrate. And I believe it's actually more solder mask. Yeah, more solder mask under there. So that's interesting. The die attach is actually on top of solder mask, not on top of copper. So the back side of the die is not touching anything. That's, that's a little interesting. I didn't notice that before. top of the die and now we can see some of our metal layers and there's probably going to be something more interesting to see if we focus a little more. Yeah, this is a 65 nanometer part so all the fine details are going to be hard to see but you can see the upper metal layer and you can see there's some vias going down to the lower layers and that's about the limit I think of what we're going to be able to make out on a 40x objective. So now let's take a look at our QFP sample and see how that one turned out. So here's our QFP. This one also turned out pretty well. Again, probably could have done another minute or so on the diamond page. You can see we've got a few more diagonal scratches that aren't quite removed, left over from the 10,000 red stuff. So uh, yeah, we could have done a little bit more on the diamond, but it still looks really nice. Let's get a little closer. Yeah, nice view of the right side of the die here with the void in the die attach epoxy. And again, zooming in a bit more, we can start to see the details of the silver grains in the silver filled epoxy here. And up to 40x, we'll see even more. Again, lots of nice detail here, all the individual grains visible. And then going up to the top of the die, let's see. Here. Again, we've got a focus shift because I only corrected for tilt in one axis. So there we go, look at that. So it looks like we've got one, two, three, four, probably five metal layers there. And let's have a look more towards the center of the die, see if anything else interesting jumps out at us. Yep, yeah, again, this is, I believe, uh, 180 or 130 nanometers, so a little small to be seeing significant details optically, especially without a 100x or 150x objective. But certainly, uh, the polish is more than good enough to see this. So, yeah, we could have put a little more time into the diamond, but probably not necessary. And uh, that's all I got for you today. So, thank you for watching, and hope this was educational.